ہم آج اس پاک انسان کی زندگی کی یاد میں جمع ہوئے ہیں آج جس کے بارے میں کہا جاتا ہے خیر الورا صدر الدفا نجب الہدا نور الولا شمس الدہا بدر الدجا یعنی تاجدار حرم سرکار مدینہ سرکار دو عالم نبی کریم محمد مصطفیٰ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ان کے بارے میں آگے اور کہا جاتا ہے کہ بلغ الا بے کمال ہی He attained exaltation through his perfection. Kashafat duja bi jamalihi. He dispelled darkness with his beauty. Hasanat jamiyo hisalihi. Beautiful are all his qualities. Sallu alayhi wa alihi. Blessings on him and his family from Allah. Ye woh huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hai. جن کے نام کے آگے بنا صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کہے مومن مومن نہیں ہوتا مومن کا دل سکون میں نہیں رہتا خیر تقریر کو اردو میں تو شروع کیا میں مگر میں نے سوچا آج کے فنکشن کے لیے اس کو انگلیش میں ٹرانزیشن کرنا بہتر رہے گا دا ریزن of this is that whether elders of our community think it is fortunate or unfortunate, the youth, they walk in English, they talk in English, they dream in English, and I don't want that the, the beautiful things that I, I'm about to speak about our Huzur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get lost anywhere in that translation. Moving forward, I'm sure a lot of us, especially living here, hear the debate of whether we should gather together for Milad and Nabi, whether we should celebrate it, why was it done this way, why do certain people do it this way. I'm of the opinion that we are, we are all sinners. ہم سب گنے گار ہیں کمزور ہیں وی آر ویک اینڈ وٹ لاس از اٹ ٹو اس اف وی گیدر ٹو این لائف ان آر دیٹ ہارٹس ان دا ریمبرنس آف اس حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ٹوڈے اف وی گیدر ٹوڈے ٹو میک دیٹ یس ایبسلوٹلی ایوری ڈے اے مسلم از سپوز ٹو ریمبر Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is in our kalma. Every step that he takes, he is called to enact the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we are weak. I, I first and foremost have difficulty doing that. And maybe most of you are better than me. I hope inshallah you are. But the reality of this is, is that there is no sin to gather on this day and remember and to as a community rededicate ourselves that from here moving on forward we will adhere to that sunnah that we will hold those things close to our heart some of the speakers before me brilliantly did explain some of the mentions of huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the quran some verses that justify the remembrance of Allah, why it, uh, the remembrance of Huzur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why it is good and why we benefit from it. I will share with you a, briefly a few of those before moving on. In Surah Al-Imran, verse 31-32, Allah says, Tell the people, O Muhammad, 
if you sincerely love Allah, then follow me. Allah will also love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is forgiving and merciful. Also tell them, obey Allah and His Rasul. In spite of the, in spite of this, if they turn back, then warn them that Allah does not love the disobedient. Furthermore, it is mentioned, Allah tells us, you have indeed a good example in the Messenger of Allah. For whosoever hopes for Allah and the last day and remembers Allah a lot. But we must make sure that we realize that, that Rasulullah was a human, he was a man. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Kaf verse 111, Say, O Muhammad, I am only a man like you. It is revealed to me that your God is one God. So let him who hopes for the meeting with his Lord do righteousness and not associate anything in the worship of his Lord. And Brother Naushad mentioned earlier already, but just as a reaffirmation, I will mention again in Surah Al-Azab verse 56. This verse reminds us again that when the angels themselves and Allah Himself sends blessing on the Prophet, then why not emulate the activity of those, those entities? Indeed, Allah and His angels send blessings on the Prophet. O believers, call for Allah's blessings on him and salute, salute him with all respect. So now that we've established that, I mean, overwhelmingly the speakers before me and inshallah the speakers after me will tell you that the importance of remembering Huzur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our life and holding his amal and his sunnah close to us. I want to share some things about, I guess the, the gist and summary of my speech would be that the Prophet as a statesman. It is crucial to note that Prophet Muhammad did not receive revelations from Allah until 40 years of his life. Think about that. Until, until he was 40 years old, he did not receive revelations. Yet, what do we know about him in his life earlier? He lived his life with uprightness, trustworthiness, and sincere honesty. Right now, I'm sure a lot of young people, and this goes for older people as well, we see many people aspiring for positions of leadership and thinking that the attainment of some degree or going through some experience gives them some stature, some, some right. Yet, this was not evident through our Prophet Wasallam's life. I mean, he, a man who spent 40 years of his life being honest, being trustworthy, it gained him the trust of his entire community. 40 years is not some short time. When, so it so became that when he did receive his revelation, many people around him knew that this man is not a liar. They knew that this man is not dishonest. The, the educated among them, the respectful among them, they, they, they had nothing in their heart that could have denied this man because for 40 years this man spoke nothing but truth to them. So what he is bringing, this message of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, this must be true. What, moving on from that, what many people may not know is that Prophet Muhammad spent about 13 years of his mission without engaging in any kind of fighting, defensively or offensively. Which means that it was only in the last 10 years that out of necessity some type of uh, fighting occurred. In fact, the early part of his mission, and it was that Muslims in Mecca were heavily persecuted. Yet they did not retaliate and they did not fight back. There, because there was a different mission that Allah had for him during those years. 
But moving on, Prophet Muhammad, when he had migrated to Medina, he had become the leader of a growing, thriving community in Medina. And he was called to protect them, which in some situations called him to go to war against his attackers. But it was clear that when the Meccans desisted from fighting back, you know, the Muslims were supposed to stop fighting themselves. As the leader, he now found that he was called upon to be more than just a spiritual guide for the community. He had to become a statesman and deal with larger communities on the level of the state, and he had to maintain the security of the Muslims. So after the span of four years, which marked three major conflicts that the Muslims got into, Muhammad mission took a, another unexpected but peaceful turn. It is remember, this, this event which I am going to briefly shed some light upon in history books has been called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The events that led to this treaty were anything but promising for the Muslims. It was now six years after the Muslim migration to Medina. And the verses establishing the central role of the Kaaba in Mecca had been revealed, where Muslims were told that they, have, they should continue to dedicate, direct themselves to the Kaaba to pray. And the general response among the people of Medina was surprise. So basically, at this point, they had decided that now since they are supposed to pray towards Mecca, they should go and do a pilgrimage. The people, why they were surprised is so they just left Mecca because they were being persecuted, because they were being violated. It became dangerous for them to openly preach and practice their religion. I'm sure many of you are aware of those numerous instances of oppression against Muslims in Mecca. That's why they left. But, so now the Prophet is going to trust and rely on the Quraysh to adhere to the old, old Arab tradition of not engaging in warfare for a span of four, four months during sacred months. Nevertheless, the people trusted the Prophet وسلم, that he had got, brought them this far, that they trusted that he would carry them forward. So his, him and his followers left for pilgrimage, essentially unarmed, going back into hostile territory, dressed in traditional pilgrim garb, and with uh, animals to sacrifice. So basically the way they left, there would be no doubt in anyone's mind about the peaceful intent of their, 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 uh, their, in, of their effort. The Quraysh in Mecca, on the other hand, were very surprised and they became very, very suspicious of this move. That why is Muhammad coming back? What does he have planned for us? What secrets are there? They were sure that there is some conspiracy involved. So, being the Quraysh, the powerful Quraysh, they gathered together 200 uh, of cavalry and set out to intercept the Muslims. This force actually, to be mentioned, was led by Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. This force was uh, the same military leader who later accepted Islam and became one of the greatest generals in Islamic history. When the Prophet learned of this army coming to attack, he changed his route briefly to avoid this confrontation and he camped at a location called Hudaybiyah. In Hadith, it is mentioned that the Prophet said, Woe to the Quraysh in, in frustration. Why should they object to me, letting me finish this affair of, of this pilgrimage that I have set, set, out, set out to? However, he, trusting the old uh, Arab tradition and trusting Allah on top of everything, continued his pilgrimage. He wasn't scared when he found out. Most people would say, I'm unarmed, I have goods with me, I have women and children. An, an army is coming to attack, I should turn away, but this is the trust that Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa had in Allah. 
And so he intended that there should be some peaceful resolution to this and said that if the Quraysh would ask us for a guarantee of Muslim intentions, that we will let them know that this is all we're coming for. And based on our old blood relationships, because in the Arab culture, the blood relationships of tri and their tri tribal relationships mattered a lot. And he said that we will be happy to give it to them. We will be happy to give them a treaty so that we could perform this pilgrimage. There were several days where there was back and forth. Emissaries were sent, and there were negotiations back and forth, back and forth. But nothing seemed to be happening right. People that the Muslims were sending seemed to have not been coming back. Most of people, most of uh, some of the people thought, "Oh, maybe they, these people were just killed." Uh, there was even an instance where local inhabit inhabitants attacked the Muslim camp one night. Many amongst the Muslims wished to retaliate. They said, "We have to defend ourselves." But Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam counseled them to remain patient. So. That, that concept of remaining patient was called the, the Bayat al-Rizwan. The Muslims demonstrated a unparalleled amount of courage and moral strength on this occasion. There were about 14, I mean, roughly numbers were 14 to 1500 men and women who were unarmed and faced the possibility of a massacre at the hands of the Quraysh. Soon thereafter, an emissary returned. Usman radiallahu anhu, he had returned and there was a, a treaty uh, negotiated. So now, everything good, right? There's a treaty that, you know, we, everything's all good. The Quraysh are okay with everything. But look at this. The terms of the treaty with the Quraysh appear to be decidedly favoring the Quraysh. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offered to compromise on every issue that the Quraysh had presented. Even signing his name on treaties as Muhammad son of Abdullah, as opposed to the traditional way he used to sign the, as Prophet Muhammad, Messenger of Allah. This was pretty big. He's making a concession so grand. So the Treaty of Debiya, as it is known, called for Muslims that, that it told them to go back. That's the one thing. So they had set with 14 to 1500 men and women, but Treaty said, no, go back right now. You can come back next year. So all the effort that you made to come this far, you have to go back right now. You can come. You can come next year to perform the pilgrim pilgrimage. That all hostilities would cease for a period of two to ten years. That at least two years that there would be no problems. And then this was a crucial part of it. Either side could form alliances with any of the tribes in Arabia. And. The, the thing about this is that many of the Muslims were disappointed by this whole affair. I mean, they had, as human beings, had more expectations of power and might from their, their prophets. And to them, it was a humiliating defeat. I mean, it, 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 it you know, there was ayats revealed. I, I don't have that ayat in mind right now, but it was revealed that the, this treaty of Hudaybiyah was a manifest victory. And... The people were like perplexed about this. However, it's interesting to know that being a statesman and the trust of Allah requires a lot of farsightedness. Events that took over the next few years provided how beneficial every concession that was made, everything that they gave up, everything that they were willing to just abide by that was so one-sided against the Muslims at that time. The next the things, it, it, were, it, was, it became manifest. The two to three years of peace that they had maintained allowed the freedom of movement for people across the Arabian Peninsula. Many tribal representatives were able to visit Medina and heard the Islamic message. How amazing is that? That because of this treaty, people were free to go back and forth and alliances were allowed to be made And these people were actually able to visit Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam without breaking any tribal allegiances, and they were able to see the practical application of the Quranic message in the, uh, the communities of Medina. And the Muslims were able to send people to other areas without being harmed. 
they're one of their biggest enemies, they have a peace treaty with them now. Whereas the Quraysh probably thought, oh, we're taking advantage of Muhammad, that you know he's gonna be under our watch. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam used this to the advantage of the Muslims, and he was able to send people to preach all over freely unharmed. What happened? The net result was an exponential increase in the numbers of Muslims in the Arabian Peninsula. Muslims, eventually they started having the momentum and the numbers. So there is an ayat revealed about this in Surah, in surah 110 verses 1 to 2 that when the help of Allah comes and as a result of that comes victory. And Muhammad, you shall see amongst men growing in large accept, uh, numbers accepting Islam. So this was just one instance that not only was the Prophet ﷺ a spiritual guide for his community, but he was an individual who with responsibility and trust of Allah led a, uh, against contrary belief that people say Islam was spread by the sword and what not. I mentioned earlier that there was no fighting for a substantial amount of years and even when there was, whatever people in modern day, it's not even Western civilization anymore, it's all around the world, the criticisms that people have, Nauzubillah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in context, especially of that time, the things that he did were superior, superiorly moral and ethical and contrary to things that other people had done at that time. And even to this day, a lot of the practices that he had done as a statesman were copied throughout history by a large number of individuals. So with that, I would just like to say something in order to just to end that off, and this is something simple enough for everybody to understand. Jis dil mein Muhammad ki mohabbat nahi hoti, us par kabhi Allah ki rahmat nahi hoti. Mera yaqida hai agar zikre Khuda mein ye naam nahi shamil ho, to ibadat nahi hoti. Assalamu alaikum. Yaar jinnat sabab.